Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. Once a year, a holiday dedicated just to you, Brad, on the show. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Do you feel like you're honored, you're special, like this is this day is about you? I haven't even Oh seen- my god, he's still talking. Good lord. <laughs> <laughs> I I hope you were spoiled today. You do. You go through it. I haven't even seen my kids today. <laughs> oh, what an amazing Father's Day for you. <laughs> that sounds heavenly. Is Hank mowing the lawn? Do you guys get him a little extender? We, he'd be, he'd be perfect for it because he's just like pure power. No. Yeah. Yeah. He might be a little rough around the edges. We'll have to, you know, be extra careful with the edger, but. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, ever since the incident, he's probably not allowed to hold one of those, but. It know. would cut the time in half. It would, but also maybe some other things. Yeah, oh, 100%. Hockey season is still going. The Stanley Cup hasn't been awarded. The draft is fast approaching, and we are now firmly into the rumor mill where it's not just speculation. It's speculation with a little flavor of substance added in as the NHS rumors have heated up for Detroit. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk to you about all things Detroit, Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL, and lots more. I'm on your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we're going to be talking about those Natchez rumors, where he might be traded to, and Detroit being around them, which is notable, as well as some other news of note for for players that Red Wings fans have been looking at across the league. Chatfield signed in Carolina, so that's a right-handed defenseman off the board, and more. We're going to get into our prospect profile this episode, which is a player that a lot of Red Wings fans have been looking at. We're not sure if he'll be in range, but there's a possibility, as well as some prospect news. And then we'll get into NHL news. The Stanley Cup playoffs go on. Edmonton forced a game five, which sounds kind of pitiful, but they did it in impressive fashion. So who knows what might happen from there. And other notes from across the NHL before we jump into overtime. Before all that, I want to let you know that the Winged Wheel Podcast is primarily supported by our Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to support the show. You get access to some really great benefits like our Patreon exclusive bonus overtime episodes, which record right after these main ones. We let loose, have fun. I usually stick some bloopers in there. We tell stories. We have thoughts with Evan. Yours is already prepped for today. Oh, yeah. You'll hear about all the all the woes that have been going on in the the house where the studio lives, which probably won't be interesting, but, you know, it's a good time. You also get access to our Patreon-exclusive Discord, which is a fantastic community. Additionally, you're entered into all of our giveaways automatically. For example, for the past two seasons, we've given away two tickets to every Red Wings home game, the vast majority going directly to our Patreon supporters. So, again, patreon.com slash wingedwheelpodcast. If you want to support the show, go the extra mile and join the Dub Dub Club. The Red Wings want to add high-end talent. Marty Natchez is high-end talent that's available. It is all but confirmed as much as something can be confirmed unless they explicitly state it, that he is not wanting to return to Carolina. In need of a contract, Carolina wants to trade him for a massive return, as you do for any player who, who has star potential. And the Red Wings have been rumored to be one of the teams around it, as reported by Frank Saravalli. So unsurprising that Detroit would be around this. I mean... A lot of times you just have to do some math in the NHL where you look at what teams need and what players are available. And it's also unsurprising because players of Marty Natchez's caliber aren't available, you know, every day of the week. So what do you make of the news that the Red Wings are around on Natchez? Outside of goaltending, he fills two of their biggest needs. Scoring and speed. The Red Wings have lacked in those departments severely for a while now. And even though we saw improvements on that this year, they're still a long way away in those two departments from cup contender. So he's one of the faster transition players in the league. And the fact that he has a scoring touch and, you know, cover years already, he's not just Darren Helm. That's really appealing to obviously the Red Wings. But like you said, it's going to be everybody in the league. Players like this don't come available all that often. Every time in the last couple of years, a player like this has come available. We've sat here and said the Red Wings should be interested. And the Red Wings have only gotten one of them because 90% of the league that can afford them is going to be interested. So like everything in life, it comes down to what's the cost? Because obviously I would love Marty Natchez on the Red Wings, but at the right cost. And I'm willing to overpay. Let's be clear here. The Red Wings do not have the luxury of getting picky in situations like this. 
and fussing over an extra half million dollars on the contract or an extra second round pick in the trade, whatever it might be. But yeah, it, it's not surprising. Just getting a little confirmation is at least nice to know, even though we could have all assumed Eiserman would be in on this. Well, this sort of bidding war will be more difficult, I think, than a, what a lot of them would look like. Like for the martyr one, obviously he's just a big ticket. It would take a lot of assets, but you know, he's a UFA. Whereas in this situation, we're dealing with an RFA whose situation with the team has really soured and it's hard to determine how many teams will be in on him. So trying to find that sweet spot on value and price and cost is going to be really difficult for Detroit. They're really going to have to do an excellent job of sort of reading the room, sort of flushing out what the the true buyers are in this market and who are just kind of throwing stuff out there to to sabotage the other teams. It'll be really interesting to see how this plays out because it's going to be difficult to really, you know, feel like you won in this transaction. There's also the sense that Carolina's basically, you don't want to say that they're talking out of both sides of their mouths here. I think they're doing what any other team would do when they are losing a player that they don't want to lose, but trying to make the most of it. They want the assets to return that say, you know, Marty Natchez is a star player, or at the very least will definitely be a star player. So we want the assets to represent that. But if you also look at how they handled him, a big thing is Natchez says, you know, he can be doing more, but he doesn't like his deployment. And Carolina wasn't exactly, you know, over the moon about what they saw from him. And that's why he didn't earn a bigger role. And he hasn't budded into the, you know, star or more that they wanted from him so far. So they're not doing anything untoward, but there is a sense of, are you really going to pay a premium to then have to pay a premium in terms of contract to get Marty Natchez when Carolina, a very strong team, has kind of demonstrated that there is risk that this is, you know, a 50 to 60 point player is all he is. And that's not nothing. Like that's something that's very good, but you don't pay out the nose for that is, is the point that I think teams have to be wary of. Yeah, but there's a couple signs here that at least point in a positive direction if you're a team interested in acquiring him. The first is there's been a lot of talk about he's just not a stylistic fit with what Carolina's trying to do over there, which means you put him in a different system that's a little more conducive to his skill set. Maybe it'll work out. Maybe it won't, but it's at least a reason for optimism. And two, you saw the list of teams that were interested that Saravalli put out there. There was a lot of them kicking around. And you have to think, given that he's an RFA, his agent has made these teams aware of what at least his rough contract demands are going to be. Well, you're not allowed to do that. Yeah, you know, they would never. Never yeah, in a never. million years. That'd be okay, let's just yeah, yeah, we need to get make that clear. Yes. It's all hypothetical texts that are being exchanged about, <laughs> you know, future problems. But... It hasn't seemed to scare away too many teams, which if it was completely unreasonable, you'd have to assume, you know, a lot of teams would be like, okay, well, uh, good luck with that. We're not interested. It could still be the case. And, you know, maybe teams are confident they can knock it down a few bucks. Who knows? It, you'll never know for sure. But. Oh, you thought I said $4 million. I actually said four d million. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, it's. It's at least something to take note of in a scenario where not a lot of information is out there. For what it's worth, I do think there is more to NHS than what we've seen. I don't think the concerns about, you know, what we've seen so far by age 25, you know, be, not being star, superstar talent. I don't think those are unfounded concerns. I do think he can and should likely be more than the player he was last season, which was 53 points in 77 games. Um, that would make him like... Fourth in scoring on the Red Wings. Almost. Yeah. But then again, what do you want to pay for that? Because you then beg the question of what guys can you get in the future? What's your salary structure going to look, look like as you've both alluded to? So I don't know. I, I'm slowly over time and I've talked about this the last few episodes coming to the mind of you don't pass up on acquiring star talent or really good talent just because it's not the perfect fit at the perfect time or it's not the perfect amount of risk that you want. I'm not saying swing on anyone, but if you and your team, in terms of analyzing this, say, yep, yes, we think this is 
the guy that's going to make our team better and he's the best player available to to acquire on the market via trade or free agency or, or what have you, then I, I kind of go back to Brad's first point, which is you pay a little extra in a trade or you pay a little extra in a contract to get it done. You don't go crazy because I, I think Natras isn't like superstar game breaker level, but this is – it's the the, the the break it tier. I think that's a good comparison. It's the same kind of impact that he could have. Yeah, I've seen the argument online that if he's not – you don't think he's going to be a superstar, why are you bothering? My answer to that is hypothetical. Do you think – to bring it, Larkin, Raymond is or is close to being a cup caliber first line. Take your most optimistic view here. Most optimistic view is that it could be, but that you have to assume the team behind them is very, very good. Okay, so if that's your first line, do they have a single second line caliber forward on the team right now? Is Patrick Kane back? As of right, <laughs> yeah. That's, as of right that. now, he's an unrestricted free agent. So no, cup caliber second line. You're not really looking at a lot of optimistic names. No, it I don't. To, it starts to stretch out quite a bit. Perron isn't it anymore? Comfer has done an admirable job filling in in absence of anyone else. But if you're winning a cup, he can't be your second line center unless you have like a Nathan McKinnon on your first line, which isn't going to happen for the Red Wings. We know that. If Patrick Kane's not back, there's nobody on that wing. Danielson could be a second liner. I think he could be a second line center. That's probably the only forward in their system right now who is likely to meet that criteria. Yeah, you can't afford to pass up on a Martin Natchez when they become available. You might get outbid and it might not be worth it. There is a line there. I'm not saying you have to go get him at all costs. Obviously, there is a line where you're like, this is unreasonable. You're making the franchise worse by making that trade. But anything under that line, you have to do it. You have to, because what else? Carter Mazur? Sure, but probably not. Marco Casper? Sure, but probably not. Whoever they pick at 15? Maybe. Well, you might have to make some of these players and assets available to get this deal done. Oh, of the three players I named there, you're not getting Marty Natchez without giving them one or two of those assets. So yeah. it's the catch 22. But again, it's an upgrade based on projection, right? We sat here and we've had how many conversations in the last two months? What are the odds of 15th overall pick becomes a second liner? Good, but far from a guarantee. And will they be a second liner to the caliber of Marty Natchez? You have to be supremely confident in your scouting department when making that type of decision. Obviously, age, contract, all that factors in, which is why when we've had these conversations in the past couple of months, I've erred towards keeping that particular pick. But concessions are going to have to be made. Projections are going to have to be made. And yeah, overpayments are probably going to have to be made. Whether or not it's Marty Natchez, some point down the line, the Red Wings need to acquire players of his caliber, if not better. And I promise you, you're not going to like the acquisition cost. Yeah, uh, that the last two points you made, I think, are exactly the thinking I have right now. Loath though I am to agree with you completely on anything, it's you have to go for it. And if they get outbid, it's okay because it doesn't have to be Marty Natchez. It's just the overall principle is the position the Red Wings are in. You want to continue to improve. They did a lot last year. They can do a lot this upcoming year just on progress of the, the players that they have, but you still need to take another step. Watch these Stanley Cup playoffs, look at those teams and say, are the Red Wings close? Are the Red Wings close and can the Red Wings get there are two different things. And you can see how they can get there, but you need to start adding guys of the right caliber. So yeah, I, I fully agree. You go for Natchez if you're, you and your pro scouting team feel that he's a fit. And if you get outbid, you get outbid because you don't go absolutely ballistic and trade everything you have but you have to start going for those guys so it, it it all does kind of add up may also help resolve the rookie log jam as well if you move out of, if you're like this guy you know might not be a surefire talent at the nhl that's when you gotta t take a serious look at who they are as assets and, and see if you can make those types of trades. And I think it might solve some problems moving them. This It's the drum I've been banging for a little while now, which is not all these guys are going to make it. You're right. You have a glut of them based on the past however many years of rebuilding and potential is worth more than what they're likely going to turn out to be. 
on average. And I don't mean for any individual player. You can't, you can't make that projection for sure. But on average, not all of them are going to work out, but a lot of them still have a lot of potential. So it's essentially like it's darts, right? You're giving them more darts to throw, but who's to say that it's going to be a bullseye? Terrible analogy, but I've had a rough 48 hours. You guys take it away. <laughs> but yeah, to, to continue your point, how many prospects do the Red Wings have in their system right now that you are fully confident are going to be full-time Red Wings? I th- I will go Danielson, Casper, Mazer, Johansson, Sandine Pelica, Kosa. The only do not trade for me is Danielson, Sandine Pelica, Kosa. Yeah. And Aug- even Augustine I would include in that. Yeah. So I that's six names. Of those six, how many are you confident are going to be top six, top four D? One, maybe two? And yeah, uh, you want to look at any individual player and say you're confident, but then the averages dictate that it's just not going to shake out that way. It could. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Every once in a while, you have a prospect that explodes. Maybe five years. We're talking about Carter Mazur as the second coming of Zach Hyman. Possible, severely unlikely, most likely scenario right now, a good depth scoring third liner. Marco Casper, most likely path right now, based on what we've seen, good 200 foot, all situations, third line center. Danielson has shown the scoring upside. Maybe he can be the second line center. Sandine Pelica should be able to play a depth defense role, but excel on the power play. Is any of those better than Natchez? Right? Like that's the scenario right now. And that's not even factoring in what the percentages are of them actually getting there or exceeding it. And the, to, to stipulate what the other side of the argument would be is you're giving up the first seven years of cheap play and development a hundred percent so you you take that all yeah. into account but the point stands yeah because obviously there is value to getting three years of nate danielson at nine hundred and seventy five thousand dollars or whatever that is and then whatever the second contract comes in and etc cetera, etc cetera. we all understand that you're basically trading the cap flexibility for the certainty of the player yeah that is the marty natchez conversation we'll see where that one goes the Red Wings and a lot of other teams will be around it. So, you know, far from a certainty, but definitely an intriguing one. Speaking of Carolina, Jalen Chatfield is one of the more popular targets for Red Wings fans to consider how to plug up that right side defense position. He re-signed in Carolina for, I think, a little bit of a term rich, but very reasonable three-year, $3 million per year contract. So you're telling me they're not going to want Justin Hall in the NHS trade? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> somehow i think the very intelligent eric tulski congratulations by the way to tulski on unsurprisingly but well deserved being hired as gm in carolina and man prashant and sean unexpected by whom they are bringing in they're as it's as it was very fairly put they're lapping us they now have a their their assistant gm total went up by one last episode, which is really good because it went down by one because one of them got upgraded to a GM. (laughs) They have brought in some really great interviews. Go check them out. But yeah, Jalen Chatfield off the board. And you know what? It's funny. You talk to people who watch Chatfield and they're like, he is being hyped up too much. He's a great player, but he's good in his depth role. He's just really effective in Carolina's system. He fits there. Good player, but he's not going to be a, you know, top three minutes guy on your team. There's other people saying this guy is the real deal. Carolina doesn't get as far as they do without him, and he can emerge in a big way on a different team. So I, I think that price that you saw is ultimately very fair, and with his strong play, he earned himself three years of security. What I took from that is a really strong indication of what the defense market's going to look like come unrestricted for agency. I mean, Carolina definitely took an educated guess, and, and Chatfield's agents surely don't know how the market is yet. They're not allowed to talk yet. But That's a good point, yeah. But it's it's a good indication that if he's willing to stay, and usually RFAs stay at a bit of a discount, because everybody knows you get more in UFA because you get more bidders, et cetera, et cetera. It it could be tough out there for teams looking for a right side defenseman. <laughs> it's not a bad inference to make. Like I, it could be a couple different things. I would just be surprised if the market's weak. Like it's such a the cap's going up, and it's such an important position. I don't know. I tend to think that this is just, it's a good fit in Carolina and he likes it there. I don't know. It's hard to say for sure, but I really think based on all indications before this, that this was going to be a hot market for defensemen. Yeah, it was, 
a volume thing? You were hoping there were enough out there that someone might sneak through the cracks and you can get that value signing. Like Eisenman's had a few signings like that over the past couple of years. I'm less optimistic that's going to happen this time around. Yeah. Elsewhere, we mentioned it last episode, and I think it was the Patreon exclusive overtime, Evan and I, but Patrick Laine is seeking a trade from Columbus. Both parties seem to be okay with moving on, working on a trade somewhere. It is a complicated one, though, because Laine has quite a bit of money left on his contract for two more years. And I know it's quite a popular sentiment. Like Laine is a very effective player when he's on, but $8.7 million a year for two more seasons is a lot of money. So, I mean, Columbus is going to want to find a solution, but they are going to have to retain a ton probably, or you don't really know where this is going to go unless he goes to one of those teams like Utah or San Jose or something. And that's the fit there. But you've seen some Red Wings fans ask the question as well. Like we said about NHS. Yes. The option should be, you are interested at the right cost. And that's a way bigger question Mm -hmm. at the right cost like you need so much retention to make that work yeah with retention trade value all that stuff but it is worth pointing out before i think line got injured and then went on leave last year he was scoring at a 30 something goal pace he hasn't lost the goal scoring touch he's just had so much going on he's always had that inconsistency about him but so is alex to bring it and to bring it can't score like line line is one of those guys when he's on, arguably the best goal scorer in the league. But we haven't seen that as much in recent years as we did in previous years. But if you're Detroit in the middle of a rebuild and, you know, you've had line A struggle with injuries and mental health, if he can find a place to be happy, which could be Detroit, you got two years to find it out. Man, that could be a serious weapon. And again, circling back to team that struggles to score conversation finds elite goal score. I think it's worth the gamble again at the right cost. Do I want him at 8.7 right now with all the stuff he has going on? No, of course not. Do I think the Red Wings are going to be super keen on this after what happened with Verona? No, obviously I think they're probably not going to be, but it's worth exploring at least because if Columbus is asking a second round pick and they're willing to retain $2 million. You're out of your mind if you don't do that. But I think the cost will be higher and I don't think Columbus will want to retain that much. But I digress. If Columbus is willing to be reasonable on it, but then you'd think the lineup to get Patrick Line would be massive. But if they're reasonable or have something reasonable to offer or they're they're willing to re- retain based on what the Red Wings would want to give them in terms of assets, then yeah, Patrick Line would obviously be a good addition. No, there, there's one person in the NHL who can shoot better than him, and it's Austin Matthews. You think he's that good of a shooter? His release is, dare I say, generational. He, I would say that. I, I would confidently say his release is gener, generational. It's, it's crazy. You're the, it's the summertime. You can say whatever you want, man. Hell yeah. Go wild. I'm with Evan. If we're just talking straight release anywhere in the offensive zone, Line A might have the best shot in the NHL. Accuracy, power, man, it, it might be him and Matthews. And on some days, Matthews is number two. I didn't even I didn't even think of Verona last time when we had this conversation. So I think there's probably a lot of scar tissue for the Red Wings organization when it comes to a situation like this. Obviously, it's not apples to apples. Everyone's personal situation is different. The context is massive. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's worth pointing out. So, yeah, you got to do your due diligence and see what sort of offer Columbus would be willing to listen to. But, yeah, the Red Wings aren't in the position to not make these types of inquiries. Inquiries, yeah. Yeah. So, the one thing that's probably worth keeping in mind, and just because you brought it up, uh, I did like that you brought it up. The lineup for suitors for line A is not going to be anywhere close to what it is for NHS. The cost acquisition is going to be much lower than it is for NHS. If you think you are the organization that can bring back the, we'll call him, we'll call it prime Patrick line A because age wise, he's still very much in it. Again, we haven't seen it in a couple of years. It's kind of like the. You know, we're going to save a few bucks here and we're gambling a little more, but if it pays off, it pays off big. And if you get him back, he's better than NHS, at least in terms of an offense side of things. As NHS is right now. Yes, correct. 
I don't know which. I would probably prefer NHS just because of the certainty of it. But yeah, if if Carolina is asking like three premium assets and Columbus is like, we'll only retain like a mill, but you can have them for basically nothing. Yeah, I'd rather do that. It's all about that one is is a complicated one. It's it's like drafting a problematic player. If you get past the hurdles of like you just talk to the agent, talk to the team, figure out, you know, is this legitimately just you need to change the scenery? Like, and that's a hard thing. Like talking heads on a podcast or on a network show or whatever, unless they know specifically like all the finer details, you'll never be able to unearth that. So this is all with the assumption that you evaluate and you say, yep, the, the person can be a fit on this team. Then, yeah, I, I fully agree, Brad. That's a, that's a risk that's worth taking because it's not a little bit of money. But with the right amount of retention, it's two years and there's a lot to potentially uncover there. And you know what? You, I was almost scared when I look up Patrick Mane's age because I was like, oh, is this one of those things where he's 33 and I'm just – time has passed way quicker than I thought? He's 26 years old. He's in the prime. So if you, if you can get that going, then that's a big boost that could come potentially cheap. It's a big if, big potentially, but it, <laughs> unless you're getting these players in, in the draft or in a blockbuster trade where you're – you're not getting a Patrick Line in the draft at this point if you're the Red Wings. Not, Cole not, Eiserman might slip to 15. <laughs> not very likely, but you can't bank on it. But I, Cole Eiserman at his best was never Line A at no, his best. No, no, Even no. going into the draft, they were not the same. And it's probably worth mentioning too because you hear all the behind the scenes issues with Line A. This is not a Pierre Luc Dubois, Trevor Connolly thing. From all accounts, Patrick Line is very well liked. Like he he's he's a good dude, and it's not that people dislike the guy, but obviously whatever he's got going on creates the issues for him, and he gets in his own head and the consistency issues, et cetera, et cetera. So not all quote unquote issues behind the scenes are the same. Yeah, as Evan said, it's not apples to apples. If we have another player we want to talk about, I am somewhat intrigued what your guys' thoughts are on Capo Caco. Well, he, they just signed him to the the. Small one-year deal. Well, that's why I'm interested in what you guys think, because that's nothing. And do I really think Capo Caco has lived up to his draft stock? Absolutely not. But is he past the point of reclamation project? So I have one thought on Capo Caco in regards to the Red Wings. Do I think he's going to get a lot better than what he is now? No. Do okay, th- then I'm not interested. <laughs> Do I think there's a chance? Sure. I, but like if he's what, like a 20, 30 point guy now, I think the chance is ah, maybe he's a 40 point guy. Do I think a consistent 35 to 40 point forward is going to outperform a mid second round pick? Yeah, 99 out of 100 times. So if that's all the acquisition cost is, 100% you do it. I don't know if I'd, I'd call it 99 out of 100, but it I, I think on average it would. But you got to think, because the whole benchmark, the 44% of second round picks that become NHLers is not 40 point NHLers. It's just they play 200 games. It's a very low bar to clear, right? And yeah. that's very heavily weighted towards the front half of the second round. And again, I know the percentages aren't the exact same anymore, but you tell me a mid second round pick turns into a 30 to 40 point forward all that often. Nah, look at all the Red Wings recent mid second round picks. I was going to say, we could just trade Brady Cleveland and call it a day. It really just depends on what New York wants to do. And you look at what happened with Lafreniere. You're we like, yep, yeah, you wish you could acquire him because you know there's talent there. And they kept him. And it turns out there was a lot more talent there. And you might see him emerge even more. Capo Caco gives me more pause, but uh, I don't know. There's ebbs and flows to both of those guys. And we've talked about the two of them a lot. How much of this is them and how much of this is the system? And at least for Lafreniere, some of it was the system. For Capo Caco, it's not as certain. But again, unless you're getting your guys in free agency or unless you're getting them in a blockbuster deal where you're trading for a certain player, you have to assume risk if you're trying to unearth talent at a less than premium price. So that's, that is what it is. I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine the price on Capo Caco has, is any low. Well, I mean, (laughs) Maybe in one year it could be lower, but <laughs> as of right now, it's pretty low. You ready for 12 points in 72 games? Hell yeah, bring it on. Okay. 
That is a lot of talk about different players who could be Red Wings. So why don't we take a break here and come back and talk about more players who could be Red Wings in terms of draft prospect profiles. But first, we want to let you know that this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by Labatt Blue Light. Created in 1983, this premium light Canadian Pilsner is a delicately balanced beer brewed with Cascade hops and a blend of malt. It's fresh, crisp, and brewed to the highest quality standards. There's a little bit of Canadian kindness in every sip of Labatt Blue Light. How did it get in there? They're Canadian. That's how. You can spread the love yourself by sharing a Labatt. And when you do share a Labatt, you're not just sharing a beer. You're sharing an experience that'll pair with anything from hockey to a hoedown. So next time you're watching a hockey with your buds, be sure to share a Labatt because while you might not all root for the same team, although we on this podcast do hope you're rooting for the Red Wings, you can all enjoy a Labatt Blue Light. We honestly love going to games in Detroit and seeing Labatt being the beer that fans clamor for all over the arena. It's a reliable beer and great to have in your hand when celebrating a goal. So head to the link in the description of this episode or the one you see on your screen to find Labatt in stores near you today. You must be 21 or older and as always, enjoy responsibly. Okay, welcome back. As we just got finished waxing poetic about how it's inevitable that Rory is going to blow it in a major... That's rough. And now I don't feel as bad about missing my, I said, I don't feel bad about missing my four footer for birdie the other day. That's an expensive miss putt for Rory plus <laughs> legacy involved. there. <laughs> that shot of him sitting in the tent is how we look after breaking news comes after we've already recorded 45 minutes of podcast. That's exactly the look I have. <laughs> okay. Let's talk hockey. and Let's talk NHL draft prospects. This is a player who has been around the conversation for the Red Wings for a long time and is of keen interest, and we wonder if he's even going to be there. Konsta Hellenius, center out of Finland, highly talented, and spoiler alert for my opinion, the more I watch of him, the more I do like him. Questions about you know size. Is he going to be able to play this way at the NHL level? But overall, thinks the game well can be an offensive talent that if this translates to the NHL level that at a positional premium could be a really high pick. So what do you think of Constantinus? Well, his skating's okay. His shots, okay. He's not very big playing in a men's league. And yet if he's there at 15, I feel like the Red Wings are going to be sprinting up to the stage to pick him because he plays center and he's highly competitive, really good hands. And for context, in Scott Wheeler's draft superlatives, where he ranks like each trait and then the players, he has Consta Hellenius ranked number one for smartest player in the draft. High, high hockey IQ. The hardest thing to teach. Some would argue you can't teach. Hey, you guys know what I like in a hockey player. <laughs> the smarter they are, the more I am all in because of that fact. You can't teach it. You look at the Mark Stones and the Patrice Bergerons of the world. They can't skate. And yet they are top 10, 20 players in the league for good chunks of their career. Mark Stone has a career. Part of his, his career that he's like famous for is stealing pucks. Yeah. He's that smart. And you factor in a really high compete level and really good hands. Yeah. I'm I'm not going to say I'm all in on him because there's lots of players in, in the range that Detroit's going to be picking that I like. But... Man, it would be at least a little disappointing if they don't pick him if he's available. Yeah, I'm not super high on Consta Hellenius. You watch him, is he has very, you know, this is going to sound bad, average skills for someone going in the first round, I thought. His agility and evasiveness is is really, really good. Top end speed's just okay. Shot, okay. Playmaking, okay. You know, he's a smaller guy. There were a lot of opportunities or moments where he got, you know, sort of outpositioned in the defensive zone. But yeah, he thinks the game really well, and that will take you a long way with just having, you know, very middle of the road ability at the NHL level. So I don't know. Maybe I'm just a little low on him. I haven't, you know, totally been impressed watching him but i think you could go a lot worse at 15 overall if he's available well 
One thing that kind of eases my mind on him to kind of compare two prospects here. It's my number one concern for one prospect, and it eases my mind with Lanius is he put up very good numbers, very good stats in the top finish league this year in the he Liga. Was, I think I saw something like for points per game as a draft eligible finish player, he was third all time in points yeah. per game. Yeah, very good production, and he's a true draft eligible this year he's not a late birthday whereas you compare to what brand said Nigard did in the Alsvenskan a lesser league as a year older late birthday it eases my mind on Hellenius because he did more in a tougher league yeah there's there are some conversations that have been happening where you see what the discourse is about Hellenius and there seems to be some that he has you know limited offensive upside and I I just I can't agree with that. I know we've had some conversations in our group chat or they've been happening to, to the same effect. I think he does have high-end upside. Is it a guarantee? I, I would, wouldn't say it's a guarantee for the reasons that you guys stated. Otherwise, he'd be you know going top 10. But yeah, I see the hockey IQ there. I see the the vision and the ability to anticipate. And I do, I do think he has... I, I'm higher on his playmaking than maybe you are, Evan. I've already seen enough of it where I'm like, it, it's a demonstration of that vision i think the offense is there the size is a question for sure because how much of the positional premium is going to translate if he's not big enough to play at that position it's harder for a guy of that size there's no other way around it but still i think he has a really good chance to come in and make an impact down the middle and if you can get that at pick 15 or at least the opportunity for it you sprint to the stage depending on who else is there there are going to be other guys but you know if the red wings really like MBN and Hellenius and Iserman and one other guy, there's a good chance that only one of those is available at best. So he's kind of the the kind of player where I'm like, the more I watch him, the more I really like his game. Yes, there's questions about it, but at the end of the day, I also think he's just going to go higher than 15 because of the the hockey IQ and the positional premium. And he shoots right. Yeah, he shoots the right shot too. He, he, people often forget that but if you're looking for a tiebreaker that sometimes happens on the draft floor with gms and, and scouting teams too he reminds me stylistically a lot of sebastian aho the good one <laughs> 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 you know sebastian aho doesn't like totally impress me when i watch him but then his counting stats and his advanced metrics are really good so you know maybe this is just another you know, I need to peel back the layers a little bit more on Constantinus and and watch more. But yeah, I th- like I said, I think you could go a lot worse at fifteen than him. Maybe it's just recency bias. Is Anton Lundell a fair comparison? That was a guy I thought about as well. Yeah, I d- I just can't help but think that people think Finnish center Anton Lundell, and thus that's what leads people to think oh, limited high end, but upside, full all around. You know smart center like they they do fit the same profile obviously they're not the same player i like helenius's bottom line skill more than i liked lundell's going into the draft obviously lundell i think is bigger but and was probably a more complete player coming in yeah but again where the red wings are i'm gonna put my lean to the skill and a tiebreaker so yeah helenius is an interesting one but i agree with what you said pre-show brad he's uh he's screams gonna be off the board to me if he was a winger like a true and true winger guaranteed, then I think probably he'd be there at 15. But the fact that he even could be a center makes me think. Tell me that guy doesn't scream Minnesota wild. A little bit, yeah. yeah. Just seems like the type. Like a, put him behind Yol Eriksson Eck and they're like, there, it's the same guy. We'll just parade them out one after another. And while we're talking about prospects, Michael Branzeg Newgard is quoted as saying he's talked the most with teams like Chicago, Calgary, and Detroit was one of them named. Thoroughly unsurprising. One of the better, if not you know, one of the best players in Detroit's potential range. Fits the mold of what Detroit is looking for. And whether you're low on him or high on him, that range is still tight. I think I'm higher on him, for example, than you are, Brad. And both of us have said we'd be very, very, very happy walking away if Detroit took him. This is where I'm at. I really like him. I like him a lot. I'm going to be upset if we pick him just from an entertainment standpoint because the Red Wings are getting so damn predictable. This will be the third year in a row where we've basically called the shot. Because, like, you were, I, I agreed with you a bit that he seemed like 
the Red Wings type, but you were all in on the Red Wings taking – they were going to take Danielson at nine last year. Yeah. <laughs> we not so subtly completely shifted our conversations a month leading into the 2022 draft around Marco Casper because we're like – there's no way we, we have they, to. Like, we have to give more coverage to this guy because we know what's going to happen. It's it's coming. So if we go three years in a row where everybody, and it's not that we're that smart, where a lot of people lock in on one guy for the Red Wings and then they take him. <laughs> well, come on, throw. For a GM that's so unpredictable, they sure are predictable with some things. Brad, you're, you're asking th- the monkey pot to curl right now. I just, I warn you, I be know, careful. I know, I know. <laughs> that's why I prefaced it by saying I'd be happy if we picked him, and I really like the player. But, like, Eiserman in his first draft threw the biggest curveball we've maybe seen in the draft in 10 years with Mo Sider. And then it's, you kind of knew everyone from then on. John Mustard at 15th overall. Come on down. <laughs> He's actually an intriguing prospect for the second round. We'll, we'll talk about him after. I can't wait to see what goalie they're going to reach. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Dude, I think you made the same joke last episode. I don't want, I don't want anything to, to do with this. You're starting to put some evil on us. So I've got two names that if it's not MBN and Eisenman goes back to his way off the board, like didn't see that one coming. So there's... Two defensemen that really strike me as an Iserman type. One of them I don't think is going to make it to their pick, which is Solberg. Uh-huh. And again, we've seen some connections to him in Detroit just because of the Mo Sider connections between the two. EJ Emery. Oh. He checks a lot of boxes for the Red Wings. And teams don't make their decisions based on the combine, but my God, did that kid crush the combine. So I'm not saying it's going to happen. But I just want it on record that I, I can see the connections. And if it happens, this will be the one conversation I can circle back to and go, see, I'm not completely dumb. His he Yeah, he is the one where his dad's a former CFL linebacker. Yeah, like the kid's an athletic freak. I don't think the offense is there but for a 15th overall pick. But we, the Red Wings have a type, let me tell you, and he checks it. That is draft prospects. Let's move on to the Stanley Cup playoffs Edmonton and Florida are going to game five since the last time we recorded Florida poured cold water on Edmonton's attempted comeback after being down two games even though Edmonton for points in that game game three controlled play and they did have a little bit of a comeback at the end where it ultimately finished 4-3 Florida put them on the brink going up 3-0 and then Edmonton came out and won 8-1 chasing Bobrovsky in the process so thoughts on those two games and where the series is at Let's call it what it is. Does Edmonton have a chance? It's hockey, so every team has a chance. Do they have a good one? No. I mean, you could argue the Oilers have been the better team for three of the four games, at a bare minimum, two. I think I probably do lean to three if you're splitting hairs between the whole series. But, I mean, I I really just wanted to go to six because I want to see what that building is going to look like. One more game in Edmonton. Oh, my God. First off, they make a millionaire every single game with their 50-50s. It's like Alberta wide. I think the last one was like the the winner took home 8 million bucks. For a one game 50-50. It happens at CFL games all the time, too. It's crazy. It's bonkers. Rabbit. And for those who don't know, in Canada, you don't get taxed for lottery winning. So that is, they they take home $8 million, which is approximately like 54 American dollars. Did you say a million or eight? Eight 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 million. Jeez, you could buy a compound in Edmonton with eight million bucks. <laughs> you might be able to buy a used Toyota Corolla with eight million bucks right now. Yeah, literally. So, I don't. I'm not even going to ask. Yeah, I was just saying not, price. not right now, Ryan. Brad's going through some car stuff oh, right now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, went through. Yeah, it's over. The you notice how his pockets. Everyone's are been yeah. dealing with a bunch of shit lately, <laughs> figuratively <laughs> and literally. Yeah, yeah, I see that all that dust flying out of my wallet. But yeah, you remember last episode how I opened and I said it's all good now. With the plumbing? Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, it was not. Narrator, it was not all good. Most things occur in a trilogy, too. <laughs> Don't I know it? <laughs> Anyhow. Anyhow. I know one of the big talking points after the last two games is McDavid broke Gretzky's single season playoff assist record. And obviously that's getting a lot of hype. I don't think that's getting enough hype. Connor McDavid broke a Wayne Gretzky assist record. I fully agree. I, I think. Well, when you have to play 30 minutes a game, like it's inevitable. 
Imagine if this series was one game different, I think that story would be through the roof. But right now, everyone is thinking, is Edmonton going to even make this entertaining? And that's what's putting a wet blanket on it. If this series is 2-2 right now, yeah, everybody's going, is Connor McDavid having one of the greatest playoffs in hockey history? Four assists. I think it's even total points in a single playoff series. The only players ahead of him right now on the list are Wayne Gretzky and Mario Lemieux. Yeah. And how many records like that are it's like Gretzky, Gretzky, Lemieux, 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 Gretzky, Lemieux. And those are the like that's the entire list of most points in a, a playoffs or most goals in a blah, blah, blah. Like those two guys alone because they just did it. Randomly, Iserman is up there once and that's it. And to get your name in there. That's like transcending. And all those records are between the years of 1981 and like 1992. Connor McDavid is doing this in 2024. Again, we talk about Connor McDavid a lot. And I still, I still will argue he's underrated. Do you, do you think he, let's say Florida puts him away in five. Or let's say Florida does it in six. Is Connor McDavid deserving of the Conn Smythe? Yes, absolutely. Yes. You can have the whole debate of do you give it to the losing team, yada, 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 which is fair. I I completely understand. He's the best player in these playoffs. Full stop. Nobody's close. Bobrovsky for three games of the finals was at that level, but he hasn't been at that level the whole playoffs. And obviously he had a really rough game four, largely not his fault, but still. McDavid's been dominant the whole playoffs. I like... If the Florida Panthers had to go these entire playoffs with Anthony Stolarz, I still think they're in the finals. Are they up 3-1? Obviously not. If you take Connor McDavid off the Oilers, do they get out of the first round? So all I'm hearing is Edmonton is a bad team. Yes, they are. Uh, they're, they're a team that papers over their issues with concrete, and the concrete is Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. Not to take away from the other talented players, but... Who would they be? So Nugent Hopkins. And, okay. Yeah. McDavid, Drysaddle, Nugent Hopkins, Evan Bouchard. I don't even know who the fifth player on the first power play unit is right now. Zach Hyman. Uh, and who deserves a ton yeah. of credit. Those five playing two minutes of every power play is like the whole reason they even made it this far. And McDavid's the driver of that. Well, Here's the nice the- thing is when they practice their power play, they only have to take five guys out of the rest of the practice. Everybody else just goes and does whatever else they do because they don't need a second unit. Here's my thing, though. I fully agree with you about the performance of Connor McDavid these playoffs. Agree or disagree, Florida did a great job shutting him down to some degree for the first few games of the series. No. Brad. Bradley. (laughs) Now, okay, hold on. I'm going to say, I'm going to say yes, I'm going to agree with you, but I'm going to put a huge asterisk on it. Yes, they did, only because Sergei Bobrovsky is a Florida Panther. He was... He That's was getting his chances. Equation, I think. It's not like they kept him out of the slot. It's not like they kept him from getting his chances. They were there. They just did not go in the net. And he was a little guilty of overpassing because you could see at points Bobrovsky was in his head. Yeah. But he was he was there. He was where he needed to be with the puck. And they just weren't dropping. And that's my point. That, sorry. And that, that is a very fair point because I didn't phrase it correctly. He did get held to one point in the first two games in the series, and I think that's important because I do think, as much as I love Barkov, I have all the time in the world for Barkov, I think even after the last game, Bobrovsky is still a guy if Florida closes it out because, okay, he had one bad game. McDavid got held to one point in two games, and that is largely because of Bobrovsky. So to me, Bobrovsky winning team, you're right. They're a much more complete team, but I don't know, is what McDavid... I just have a hard time not rewarding someone on the Florida Panthers if they if they close us out in five or six. You know, Con Smythe is a two horse race. It's Bobrovsky or McDavid. Yeah, I, I actually agree at this point. Now I, that McDavid has that record, it's kind of unfairly pushed Barkov out of the conversation, even though he has just been clinical. They do not have the balls to give it not to a Florida Panther if they win it at home. No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. That I, arena I, will burn to the ground. The Con Smythe will be smelted into its original <laughs> material if it is not a Florida It'll Panther. It'll forever be lost to the state of Florida. After like a lot of other things have been. <laughs> after all of the hyping of Alex Barkov at this point in the playoffs, even if you think it's right or wrong, I still think Connor McDavid is three on the list. He's not three. He's I, not, I, but think of how, think of all of the storylines and how 
Sasha Barkov is now this like what one of the best players in the world. I can count it in one hand. And everyone's talking about how Bobrovsky is essentially unbeatable, minus last game. I, given how these things typically go, I would be absolutely floored if it that goes back to Florida and they give Connor McDavid the cons. My, think about how crazy that is oh, before, they, you, before you rebuttal. I agree with you. That is not what's going to happen. I'm talking about what not is. I'm saying what should. But I agree with you. It's not going to happen. It's never going to happen. They ha- Edmonton has to at least get to game six for McDavid to even have a hope at actually winning the trophy but it is a two-horse race barkov is a clear number three but he's a distant number three because to your point and it's correct florida wins this cup it's because bobrovsky shut down mcdavid in the playoffs if edmonton makes this a series it's because Connor mcdavid went to an- another ridiculous level which he did last game i think the nhl would happily do it and I don't mean this against I, – I think it's really cool to see another hockey market emerging like Florida and Tampa Bay have been over the last little while. Like this is going to have a profound lasting effect on hockey in the state of Florida for years to come. And we already saw this in California when Gretzky went there. But this isn't the same as the NHL going into Chicago or New York and giving the opposing team's player the con Smythe. They're going to want to promote Connor McDavid because he is the face of the league. And I think the NHL absolutely, though they don't often have them, they would absolutely have the balls to give Connor McDavid the con Smythe. Because that, that no, is, they don't. I think they do because I think that's their dream scenario. Their dream scenario is that this goes to seven. And- You're going to do that. May I remind you that Florida Panthers play in Florida. So you're going to give 20,000 people from Florida. You're going to 20,000 Florida men. <laughs> the newspapers will love it. I think the NHL would happily do it. I think they'd be thrilled for the opportunity to still make sure that Connor McDavid walks away with hardware. Connor McDavid might punt that thing into all the way to Cuba on the way out the arena. Shows him. My my severe lacking of understanding of Florida's geography, mind you, but I think the NHL would happily find a reason to give Connor McDavid, and not like it wouldn't be deserved, because I think Brad's point is very fair. But they would happily find a reason to make sure Connor McDavid walks away with something, because he's the face of the league at the end of the day. The reality of it is, it's like the writers that vote on the Con Smythe anyway. Storylines are everything, so how the next game go could be what sways it. If if it's a repeat of Game One. It's going to be unanimous for Bobrovsky because, oh my God, he did it again. He shut them out. Edmonton could have won the series 4-1 because of how the games went, but here they are in five Florida winning. Of course it's Bobrovsky. Or if the Oilers win the next game 5-3, McDavid's got another four points. At that point, it doesn't matter what happens in game six. It's going to be McDavid. So storylines are everything. Narratives, as much as people don't want to believe it, will play into this. And I just looked at all of the betting websites that I could find very quickly. Only, oh, never mind. And it just supports my argument, so it's even better. So I will definitely be telling you guys. <laughs> I'm impressed that you were going to tell us anyways. Uh, yeah, believe it or not. Uh, Connor McDavid is third on all those lists. Third. Yeah, that's, that's wrong and bad. <sighs> but Evan Bouchard is plus 13,000, so... If Evan Put Bouchard money there. isn't he like third in playoff scoring? I don't think that's getting <laughs> talked about enough. If he scores six goals over the next three games and Edmonton wins, and three of those are like overtime winners, then yeah, Evan Bouchard's in the conversation. I you're right though. How the next I mean, minimum one game goes. If the next game goes, Connor McDavid, another four or five points, he's the the highlight of the game. And then game six is this like long drawn out triple overtime thing. Connor McDavid scores the winner. Then, in my mind, your argument moves to being correct no matter what the end result is. Well, then we're in game seven. Which we all hope for. I don't. Because I don't, don't want to be wrong now. <laughs> well, that's the thing. If Florida wins their next game, I'm correct. I called Florida yeah, no, five. A hundred percent. But I still want seven because no one like I'm happy he didn't go to sleep. That would have sucked. I would have what a wet for blanket. Who? Oh, I guess the NHL. For neutral fans. Eh, no. You I'm just happy. care about being the most right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. We're not also talking about the other historic thing that's happening right now in the Stanley Cup Finals, and that's Darnell Nurse re- racing for the plus-minus record. Oh, my God. You know what? Of all the criticisms of Darnell Nurse that are very fair, because he's overpaid and 
I th- obviously everyone's playing hurt right now, but obviously his injury is a little bit more than most. Are you really going to nail him for plus minus when his team's save percentage from their goalies has been so bad? Now, Stuart Skinner was lights out for about at least two rounds worth of hockey. Yeah, but he had a lot of like Stuart Skinner isn't perfect every game. But the dash is next to Darnell per- Nurse's name is so impressive. Rory McIlroy needs to take notes. Oh, is he not? <laughs> <laughs> That's killer, man. Is, is Skinner's numbers bad because Darnell Nurse is on the ice a lot? <laughs> I think they are coexisting with one another. It's been a, a good Stanley Cup final. I hope it keeps going. It it really like, it's when, interesting. When like Edmonton it's... said, like we we know we have the game to beat them. It's just. What it was for the first three games is you're playing the buzzsaw that's Florida, and when you manage to outplay them, you then get the absolute freak that is Bobrovsky and net, which is unfair because usually teams have one or the other. But they persisted and they broke through, and if you break Bobrovsky, then you can break the team. So it's very unlikely that they're going to win four straight, but I think they have a really good chance to make it at least a game six or game seven. We'll find out soon. Elsewhere in the NHL, we mentioned uh, Tulski in Carolina got hired as the GM. So congratulations to him. Friend of the Winged Wheel Podcast Network, as he has appeared on Expected by Whom. Go listen to that episode. And speaking of Expected by Whom, what a fantastic interview they had with the Dallas Stars assistant GM, Mark Janko, which was outstanding. Timely with the whole cap friendly thing going on. And they talked about the you know, Vegas situation and, and what they felt about, you know, working with the cap that way, whether it's gaming the cap or not, like really, really great interview. Some of the best insights I've ever heard on a podcast. And it's right from a Dallas Stars assistant GM. And there's a Red Wings tie in there, too, because he talks a lot about Jim Nill, who has won his second straight GM of the year award, which is well deserved over there. So make sure you check out Expected by Whom, give him a follow and subscribe on YouTube as well. Okay. Let's jump into overtime on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. Overtime is brought to you by our Patreon supporters, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. The Discord, the bonus episodes, the giveaways, all of that, and lots more. You allow us to support the Jamie Daniels Foundation through events like Winged Wheel Podcast Nights in partnership with the Detroit Red Wings and the Grand Rapids Griffins. You also allow us to produce content like expected by whom. And you allow this show to keep going over the offseason, get bigger and better, run live streams during the draft, and lots more. So again, Patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Questions from our patrons. Jack Mullen says, do you think Danielson's absolute highest ceiling could be comparable to Barkov? <laughs> Absolutely not. God, I wish. Nate Danielson's absolute holy hell. Can't believe how well this has gone. Ceiling is Larkin. Like that's like, oh my God, 110% of what we expected. <laughs> If you're saying like the 0.0 whatever percent likelihood that he could turn into Barkov, yeah, sure. Why not? And any guy could turn into any guy. Would you qualify it as anything higher than that? No. Like it depends on how infinitesimally small of a chance you're talking about here. Like I'd sure, I'd sure be happy. Oh, that'd like be the, great. The percentage of Danielson turning into Larkin is sub 1%, right? Oh, I wouldn't call it sub 1. Like what's the max? 5? Uh, that's That'd be the max to me. Yeah. It's And this is like a fool's error and trying to put a number on development like this. But it, it just goes to show you, like, if you thought there was any higher of a chance than that, that he turns into Barkov, he's not going. Barkov went second, right? Yes. He's not going where the Red Wings took him. Danielson got taken ninth, and most people around the scouting world thought it was a reach at the time. So do with that information what you will. Barkov theme going on right now. Datsuk Dangler 13 says, what is your favorite Datsuk highlight? And is Barkov the current equivalent of Datsuk? No. I, no Datsuk no. doesn't have, what made Datsuk special is he was a mix of like Kovalev and Barkov. Yeah. Barkov doesn't, eh, Barkov's highlight reel is impressive. But Very not, impressive. But not to the like, oh my God, he's just murdering people with a hockey puck that Datsuk was. He might be the closest though. Like the guy who can play defense, but also has like the the wicked offensive abilities and sick hands. Yeah, it might be him. They're not in the same category, but very different stylistically. Yeah. If you want to go into details, but in terms of like impacts at both ends of the ice, then yes. Yeah, I don't hate that comparison as much as I did initially. Give Wom in the heart says, would Marner, Larkin, Raymond be a top five, 
top line in the NHL. Raymond Marner Larkin? I think it very well could be. Yeah, why not? Top five. So trying to run through. So they wouldn't match Colorado's. They wouldn't match Edmonton's. I'd argue that's probably not quite at Florida's. Dallas? Mm, I'd put them there, put them there with Dallas. If you mean like on paper, probably in and around. If you mean how they can be performing, yeah, absolutely. There's Obviously, no you there. need to we're we're doing a hypothetical versus realized chemistry. Yeah. yeah. David Johnson says, my first time on Patreon. David, thank you so much for joining the Dub Dub Club and welcome to the show. Says, my question is, how much does Stevie have to overpay to get free agents to come here? I know the cop contract is not ideal, but until Kane decided on Detroit, it wasn't a destination for free agents currently. Also, Evan, what kind of bike was that in the background during the videos shot from home? You have a, do you even know the kind of bike? Yeah, I do. I don't want to say it because then people are going to Google it. And then we're going to have all this shit start up again. What do you mean? What's well, that? like people all just annoy. Uh, it yeah. was $9,000. They'll reach out to me on Insta, uh, Twitter and I won't read it. And Oh, so you want to be left alone. Yes. Oh, everyone leave poor Evan alone. But I also alone. want to be a social media influencer. So, <laughs> so you're really bad at it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like me and follow me, but don't ask me questions. I'm that's tired. Right. Of- yeah, that's right. I'll, you know what, David? I'm going to ask Evan's wife, and she's going to tell me, and I'll message you the She answer. will not tell you. Yes, she will. Why not? Do not do that. <laughs> yes, you know she will. <laughs> do not do that. Uh, it depends on the player. It, to bring it, you know, uh, not that he came in cheap, but he wanted to come to Detroit. And players who are from the Michigan area, they want to come to Detroit. Detroit's also, like, they're now way less of a, it's way less of a problem of them not being a destination because they're starting to show success again. And it's one of the premier hockey markets in the NHL. But if they're bidding against teams who are closer to the cup, which is always a risk, they'll have to do that with Kane probably. Then you're overpaying. It's less about money. It's more about term. You usually have to throw an extra year, for example, if you want to know specifics, that uh, that's what it seems like to me. And for me, this is even more reason why you need to re-sign Patrick Kane. Because guys clearly want to play with him. He's one of the best players of all time. He is a selling point to Detroit, which should, in theory, help lower that price it would take to bring these guys here. Matt says, assuming other teams don't just go wild for positional need, is there anything that would concern you if a top 10 guy unexpectedly falls to Detroit's spot this year? Are there certain traits you begin to question first? Asking for a friend who is pumped when we got Zadina at six. <laughs> <laughs> Lots so, of friends, yeah. So based on who's supposed to go in the top 10 right now, no. Because the guys who you're talking about are already, you're seeing them outside the top 10 in mock drafts and rankings a lot. You're Cole Eisermans of the world where the upside is obvious, but the risks are also obvious. You know, apparently the medicals on Caden Lindstrom came back good, so he's not getting out of the top 10. And if a Berkeley cat gets out of the top 10, you can't tell me that's for any other reason than he's like five foot 10. It's, unlo- you're sprinting for the, to the stage for Berkeley cat in my mind. Uh, if he gets out of the top 10, I'm calling every team picking from 11 to 14 until someone says yes. And there seem to be a couple around there who are trading their picks too, so. Could be bad interviews too. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I really wish there was more insights into the interview process. It it will never happen this way too. But I think in the NFL, for example, you just, because there are bigger personalities in the NFL, but you get so much more insights into this guy really impressed scouts in interviews. Like this is the kind of, you know, person he is. This is what he brought up in his interviews. You seem to, there seems to be a fly on the wall. This coach took off his shirt in the interview. Was it Pete Carroll who took off his shirt? Couldn't tell you. Now it's concerning that I'm the only one who knows this, but I'll, I'll go on. And in the NHL, it's, you know, once every 10 years we get, yeah, Steve Eisenman asked this guy if he smokes weed. They'd be like, didn't someone recently ask us, like, if you, were in the, if you were in the war, would you be a medic, a pilot, or a sniper? It's like, what kind of question is that? <laughs> I'd be a tugboat. Yeah. Maybe it's just a guy who's, like, really into More tugboats. More of a logistics officer, yeah. if I may say myself. I'd work in the commissary. Although there was one thing that got me on maybe pro defense pick at 15. I was listening to Max and Corey on their podcast and Corey was talking about how uh, Stian Solberg was getting interviewed. And obviously he got this from a source, I'm assuming, but I guess they asked him a question. Who do you think is going to draft you? And he just looked back at him and said, I think you are. (laughs) (laughs) Immediate fan. (laughs) 
I'm hired. <laughs> Holy shit, can he do that? <laughs> you can't fire me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. I need to curl up and cry and anticipate the plumber's budget for tomorrow. Thank you all so very much for tuning in. We really, really appreciate it. This offseason is now starting to ramp up, which is going to be fun. I know we have differing opinions, but I hope that the next time we record, there's still Stanley Cup playoffs going on, but we'll see. Thank you all again so much for tuning in. Thank you to Labat Blue Light for sponsoring this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. And thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. We couldn't do it without you. Patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to support the show. And if Patreon's not for you, but you still want to support the Winged Wheel Podcast, leave us a rating wherever you get your podcasts. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, do the little thumbs up. Hit subscribe wherever you listen or watch. It really, really does help. And tell a friend. To all of our name-level supporters on Patreon, thank you so much. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Akefer, Samuel Soderholm, Icon, Victor Zetterberg, Ryan, Brad, I'm Swallowing, Hannah, Glenn Brabham, Croner's Left Knee, Ashley Van Conant, Sea Lion, Keenan O'Donoghue, Brad is Wrong and Plays Like Sprong, Matthew M. Rice, Admiral Matt S. of the Cheesebag Navy, Avery Sloppy Seconds, Carl Brutina Nanaluski, Carl Provi, Citizen High Five, Clip Clop Nene, Connor Scovey, Craig Kibble, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek N. Stam, Cider, comma, Dickens, formerly Marlon Winchester, DJ Denton, everyone looking at their phone right now is a dork, God Creatives, Give Blood Fight Probert, Goose Looney's Drinking Club, Hockey Town Love, Hockey Town Matt, Hassan al Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Jeff Pridemore, Joel Miranda, Jonathan Miller, Kalen Wood, Marcus, Marty, Matt Keeler, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, R.A., Rawl, Pud, That's What I Appreciates About You, S. Klein, Scott Martin, Skeletor, Screen Lube, Stoli 70, Wingnut, Utah, Storm and Mormons, Wallman's Elite Dancing D, Iser Plan Stan, General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army, Sam Bankson, A.A. Ron, A.B., Adam Rose, All Motor, No Hands, Axel Sandy Pelica, Bellingham Acid Balls, Shy Town Wings Fan, Chimkim Nuggets, Chuck Buff Chest, the Tarpless Goon, Commander Ben Baron of the Cheeseback Space Force, Connor Layton and Corey Prita, Darren Fick, Datsuk's Dirty Deke, D Bots, who I believe is a new name level sponsor, Eric Nance, Evans Fourth Putt, Frank Stanley, Gene Sullivan, Griffey Boy, James Pridemore, Jeremiah Dobo, JM Rhapsody, Joey Jojo Shabadoo, John Evans Derogatory, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Les Grossman's Ungodly Firestorm, Linda Hull, Michigan Boy Navs Country, Oophelia, Salt Lake Sugar Girly, Steven, The Hodag, The Hat123, Throw the Road Puss, We Be Big Chungus, Spend in Cheese, We Be Big Chungus on BLAP's We Be Be Chungus down in NYC. Uh, Read, as always, thank you. Wings fan in St. Louis, Scott, and your second favorite patron. Thank you all so very much. We'll talk to you midweek. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.